Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Welcome to the second session of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program showcase. My name is Clive Rossiter and I'm Geoscience Australia's Chief Transformation Officer. I'll be moderating this afternoon's session titled Geoscience for All Australians. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have lived and shared culture in the Canberra region for many thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I also recognise our First Nations partners and traditional custodians of the lands we have accessed throughout this program, whom you'll hear more about later in this session. Finally, I extend a very warm welcome to all First Nations Australians joining today. This morning, we heard from the Honourable Madeline King, MP, Minister for Resources and Minister for Northern Australia. We also heard from our CEO, James Johnson, and from the Chief of Minerals and Energy and Groundwater Division, Andrew Heap, on the significant scale and impact of the Exploring for the Future program. If you missed that session or would like to access the outputs we're releasing, there are links on the showcase webpage. The work we're showcasing today was only made possible through extensive collaboration, and we sincerely thank all our collaborators for their valuable contributions. We absolutely could not have done it without you. This session will start by highlighting the historic importance of geoscience to Australia. It will then focus on how we consult to undertake our and share our geoscience with communities, First Nation groups, and subject matter experts, and with non-geoscience experts. This will be followed by a Q&A session after the presentations where you can ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentations to submit your questions. Please, if you think of anything you'd like to ask, send it through. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators, and other professionals. And if they cannot answer your question today, they'll be happy to take it on notice via our email, eftf at ga.gov.au. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Verity Normington, who will talk about rocks that shape Australia, sharing stories of Australian geoscience through an exhibition. Verity is a self-professed rock chick who loves telling the stories of rocks. As Director of Strategic Science for Geoscience Australia's Office of the Chief Scientist, Verity combines passion for geoscience communication and stakeholder engagement with applying STEM knowledge and skills in implementing policies to this really important work. 
Verity was an Australian Science Policy Fellow in 2020 and a superstar of STEM in 2019-20. She has a PhD in Geology from the University of Adelaide in characterising and reconstructing the beginnings in the formation of our landscapes in Permian times, when much of Australia was part of the Gondwana supercontinent and covered by large ice sheets. Prior to joining Geoscience Australia, Verity worked as a mapping geologist for the Northern Territory Geological Survey. Take it away, Verity. Rocks That Shape Australia shows how rocks and their stories can be valued by different people and different groups. This could be economically, culturally, environmentally and historically here in our public spaces in Canberra. As part of the knowledge sharing project, we have developed an exhibit using contemporary exhibit design techniques. The exhibit so far features 10 rocks from around Australia, each with an accompanying object designed to show visitors one of the ways rocks can be valued. QR codes allow visitors to dive deeper and explore more stories about each rock. We invite visitors to share their opinions about which rocks they think shape Australia. I'm going to give you a quick taste of some parts of the exhibit, but I'm not going to share all of them with you now. I want you to experience them next time you come visit us in Canberra. This rock is the oldest one we have in the Rocks That Shape Australia exhibit. It's three billion years old. It's called a banded iron formation, but sometimes we call it a biff. And this one's from the Pilbara in Western Australia. The red layers in the rock are evidence of the first time Earth had oxygen in its atmosphere. The oxygen was essentially rusting the iron in the sediments to form this red colour, which is why this rock has such a beautiful red colour now. The link between the banded iron formation and the oxygen that makes it red is represented by the scuba diving tank. This link encourages visitors to draw their conclusions about the objects and how they relate to the rock. Those connections are then explained in the text panels within the exhibit. This piece of banded iron formation is notably beautiful, but this rock and others like it have played an important part in Australia's economic history. Australia is well known as a continent with red soils and sands that are rich in iron oxide that is in some places formed iron ore that is used to make steel. The Pilbara region in Western Australia is the most famous iron ore producer. Iron ore has been mined there since the late 1940s. Iron ore has been important to Australian economies since then and will continue to be important. One of those future economies is green steel. As an emerging technology, green steel and its production changes how we manufacture the materials to build things in Australia and contribute towards a net zero society. You'll learn more about green steel during the showcase on Thursday. You'll also learn more about where it could potentially be produced in Australia. During session two on Thursday, you'll hear more about the National Groundwater Systems Project. This project has developed an understanding of groundwater systems, integrating available geoscience data and emerging technologies to best characterise and manage groundwater supply across vast areas of arid Australia. This sandstone is about 1.8 billion years old. It's part of the geological sequence of the Great Artesian Basin. It's from Central Australia, near Stanwell. As a part of Australia, where groundwater is one of the most precious commodities. Groundwater is essential for natural ecosystems as well as for people. Groundwater also contributes water directly into rivers and lakes as base flow, often maintaining surface water bodies in times of drought. Knowledge of where water can reliably be found at the surface is expressed in the landscape and has been passed down by First Nations Australians for generations. This artwork was created by First Nations Australian artist Janet Long Nakamara. In the text displayed in the exhibit, 
Janet explains that the circles in her artwork represent the groundwater springs that her ancestors would find in the dry seasons in the central desert areas of Australia. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the importance of First Nations Australians and the connection that they have to country. We hope that by putting this artwork and the sandstone together, that our visitors can also reflect upon the long history of country and First Nations Australians. Many of you would have heard of Broken Hill, and some of you may know that the zinc, lead, and silver from the Broken Hill mine is world renowned. This piece of Broken Hill ore is full of sulphide minerals that host that mineralisation. While mine production is slowing down in the region, there are further avenues to explore beyond the Broken Hill deposit, including what can be extracted from the mine's waste as part of the circular economy. You can learn more about mine waste and the circular economy during session one on Thursday. This drill bit was once used to drill through the surface and collect rocks and sediments from underground. Scientists can then use those rocks and sediments to better understand the geology, landscape evolution and resource potential of an area. But this drill bit isn't just a piece of history, it's a window into the future. The Exploring for the Future program has improved how we see into the subsurface. Through increased national coverage of geophysical maps, our understanding of buried systems continues to grow. I hope that's shown you a bit of a sneak peek of our newest exhibit, Rocks That Shape Australia. And I hope that we've shown you how rocks and stories have value to different Australians in different ways. We've received great feedback from visitors, including the Minister for Resources, the Honourable Madeline King, who has so far visited the exhibit twice. Enjoy the rest of the showcase, have a happy National Science Week, and I hope to see you all here in Canberra soon. Thank you, Verity. So great to see the new exhibition in your presentation. And I'd also encourage anyone who happens to be in Canberra to drop in and experience the exhibition themselves. It really is fantastic. Dr. Margie Sweeney will now present on fieldwork and community engagement across the whole country. Eight years of learning. Margie has been at Geoscience Australia since 2018 in both education and geophysics teams and is currently the manager of the Access Engagement team at Geoscience Australia. Margie is passionate about communicating science to the community. After completing a geology degree, Margie worked as an exploration geologist before obtaining an education diploma and teaching science in Australia and Africa. Margie completed a PhD in applied geoscience at the University of Canberra, gaining further engagement experience working with farmers and other natural resource managers. Over to you, Margie. I'm going to talk today about the extent of land access undertaken for the Exploring for the Future program. Some of the tools that we created to help with that engagement for land access and also some of the key lessons we learnt along the way. But before I do that, first of all we need to point out that to do any type of field work we are completely reliant on the land holders and the traditional custodians who help us to, to get out onto their land. Um, so first of all, we need to thank all those people, but also I want to thank all the geoscientists and support staff who helped with land access over the eight years, including huge contributions that have come from our state and territory partners. All right, so the first four years of the EFDF program focused on Northern Australia, where data was acquired on an area of about 2.9 million square kilometres. The majority of farmers, First Nations groups, other landholders that we engaged with for the, were mostly for large regional surveys, um, such as the two examples on the screen. Um, on the left is a map of deployments that we undertook for the Auslamp survey, the red dots in the map. Jing Ming is going to be speaking about that later on in the showcase. And on the right, the very extensive Airborne Electromagnetic Survey, the AUSAEM program that Yusin and Leigh Cooper will be presenting on later. For the Airborne surveys, engagement mostly comprised of notifications through emails and using mediums such as newsletters, 
newspapers and radio advertising. The second phase of the EFTF program started in 2020 and was a big step up again in land access and engagement complexity as field activities were being planned in every jurisdiction across Australia. For example, the Osiray program. In the second phase of Exploring for the Future, it was easily the most complicated land access project we've ever undertaken in such a short period of time. Alexei will present more on this work later in the program. Installing passive seismic stations every 200 kilometres across Australia, the black dots in the map that you can see, um, and those stations were sited on land with every type of land tenure imaginable, and we also had to deal with COVID, bushfires and extensive flooding in some of those areas. For ground-based field activities, cultural heritage due diligence is far more rigorous, and as well as access permissions, biosecurity inductions, national park permits, there are also many other requirements we need to make sure we um, fulfil to so we don't impact on everyday activities, heritage or livelihoods of the people who look after the land that we work on. This map shows the extent of land access to, or of interest to GA staff for proposed field activities throughout the EFTF program. The green indicates areas for the first phase of the program from 2016 to about mid-2020, 37,000 land parcels. The pink indicates 122,000 land parcels that were the focus of engagement from mid-2020 onwards, and brown shows areas where we engage for both parts of the program. It is important to note that the map shows areas where GA engage with people regarding land access. However, it doesn't mean that we got permissions or that field activities took place in all of that area. In some instances, the landholders and traditional custodians didn't give consent or priorities for the science teams changed, so activities did not go ahead. In other cases, the planned locations of field activities, flight lines or equipment deployments were moved due to the risk of impacting cultural heritage or farming activities. The data displayed here on the slide um, is from the second phase of the EFTF program because we weren't collecting that sort of data for the first phase. To ensure consistency in our approach to land access and make sure that we engage with the most accessible language, a series of engagement tools were produced under the Exploring for the Future program too. Demand for these types of resources has grown throughout the first phase of the EFTF and I'm going to introduce some, to you to some of these tools and briefly discuss which ones worked and which ones did work so well. The first suite of tools we produced were animations designed to help explain data acquisition techniques. The most common technique animations were translated into multiple languages, including First Nations languages. Now, ideally, formal surveys are the best way to evaluate the usefulness of engagement tools, but our stakeholders give their own time to engage with us for access or cultural heritage. So we don't want to inconvenience them by sending a whole bunch of surveys as well. So informal evaluation techniques are chosen to limit inconveniencing these people further. We do monitor YouTube analytics that describe the number of viewers of all of our animations. This is the graph here on the left. Um, and as you can see, the animations describing the AEM surveys or airborne electromagnetic surveys have been viewed the most. This is probably because this link was included on fact sheets sent to so many people as part of land access for those programs. In general, we have found the animations have been helpful as part of explanations, and they have been picked up by exploration companies and some of our collaborative partners as part of their communications too. However, one Aboriginal land council reported that faceless characters in the animations were a bit creepy, and they didn't want to share them with the people they represented. This view does not necessarily detract from how useful the animations are as a tool, but it is an indicator that we probably need to do a bit better, making them a little bit more relatable. Also, we have had feedback from Aboriginal stakeholders that the translations don't really add much value. Many of the people in more remote communities speak English, even if it is their third or fourth language. So they view the translations as more of a novelty rather than something that enhanced their understanding more than the animation just by itself. All right, so other engagement tools that we've created under EFTF included models. Some of these are 3D printed models, such as our little Vibra size trucks, designed in collaboration with our 
field operations and engineering team. Models have proven to be particularly useful as people can visualise what to expect without the need to read or understand verbal descriptions. The models have also been very useful in opportunistic outreach undertaken in schools near where field activities are, are taking place. The portable seismograph has been tested alongside our mobile lab outreach exhibits at shows in Canberra, Mildura and Mount Isa and many schools along the way. It was voted as by the public as one of the most popular activities and led to questions from kids and adults about our Osiray Passive Seismic Project and also the structure of the earth amongst other things. We also sent miniature seismographs like this one to teachers in remote communities in WA and northern New South Wales. Um, and these were used to help explain why we were installing passive seismic stations nearby, but also just to help with earth science communication and understanding in those schools. Um, in collaboration with our education team, lesson plans have been published to help teachers set up their own classroom seismographs and learn about the science of detecting earth vibrations. The other tools we have created are really to help our own scientists engage with more confidence and to make it easy for them to be able to return data to impacted stakeholders at the end of projects. For example, our groundwater data return template was tested with landholders in the Menindi area when we were doing field work there as part of groundwater um, studies that we're doing with the landholders. Providing data back to landholders traditional owners and other interested stakeholders at the end of surveys is important and usually quite appreciated, but it is an area we still need to be doing better going forward. While I can't cover all the things that we learnt about land access over the eight years of the program, here are my five main takeaway messages. First of all, it is worth engaging with people who have an interest in the land where surveys are being proposed and not just the landholders. While there might be short-term costs in terms of money and time, in many cases there are longer-term benefits even beyond the immediate field project. This also links to being transparent about how our data will be used. People are going to find out anyway. So being honest and upfront builds trust. Third point is don't assume that people don't want our data. For example, many First Nations group and farmers are keen to have our data in the same way that exploration other geoscientists are, so that they can make informed decisions and also when other geos come knocking on their door, they can be better prepared. It can also help them with land management decisions and planning. Number four, we found that in every case where we admitted to making mistakes to farmers or traditional custodians, it actually led to better relationships. They were more likely to trust us because we showed respect and we were trying to do the right thing. And finally, I want to promote the virtues of undertaking opportunistic outreach and just outreach in general. Um, not only is it an efficient way to return data at the end of projects to the people who helped us collect it, but it also builds goodwill in communities paving the way for future easier land access conversations. If communities know who we are and what we do, that will place us in a better position the next time we engage with them about anything. It's all about building trust. Please get in contact with me if you are interested in any of the engagement tools that I have just spoken about and for any questions. Thank you, Margie. The scale of community consultation on behalf of the program is truly staggering and clearly has a really big influence on making sure that we're meeting the needs of stakeholders and genuinely engaging. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Meredith Orr on sharing geoscience for managing country. Meredith holds a PhD in Earth Sciences from the University of Melbourne and gained 10 years experience as a Monash University lecturer before joining Geoscience Australia in 2011. Meredith has contributed to the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program the Geological and Bioregional Assessment Program and Energy Resource Advice at Geoscience Australia, before continuing to build relationships with First Nations organisations through the Exploring for the Future program. In her recent role, she builds on what she had earlier learnt from being part of Monash University's multidisciplinary work with First Nations peoples. Thank you, Meredith. 
Thanks for the introduction. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining to listen about our initiative to learn from and share knowledge with First Nations Australian organisations. From October 2022, the program worked with three different types of First Nations organisations to build relationships. These were an Aboriginal corporation, a ranger program and a land council. Our partners were the Nutterbulgan Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, the prescribed body corporate for Jungan people in North Queensland. The Lake Air Basin Rangers, a First Nations ranger program that provides cultural and natural resource management services across Western Queensland. And the Anandiliakwa Land Council, a Commonwealth corporate entity that supports the peoples of the Groot Archipelago in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Given their locations in three different parts of the continent and the different roles these organisations play with the communities they support, how diverse were the priorities, aspirations and plans that we learned about? We learned about a remarkable consistency in their priorities. And to know about this, we need to zoom out and talk about what's happening across Australia over the last few decades. The last three decades have seen growing investment in First Nations land management across the continent. This investment is driven by the demonstrated environmental, economic and social benefits of their natural resource management. It can also foster new constructive relationships between First Nations and government organisations, especially where First Nations peoples perform valuable land management services. It is also driven by the increasing extent of formally recognised rights and interests of First Australian peoples in land, which in recent years covers more than half the continent through registered native title determinations and tenure. Many First Nations organisations are building land and water enterprises and ranger programs in this process. In this context, Geoscience Australia could act on new opportunities to contribute earth sciences data, information and expertise to support land management for future environmental, economic and social benefits. For First Nations peoples, it is part of a journey to reaffirm or regain the relationships of people to country. First Nations land and water management are linked to health and well-being of people, as quoted here, through the understanding that if you look after country, country would look after you. First Nations people across the continent are at different stages in this journey. Some have established enterprises and ranger programs that include or undertake land and water management. Others are overcoming challenges to begin this journey towards investment in custodianship of country. Nutable Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, or NNTAC, helped us understand the challenges of this journey. The NNTAC is the prescribed body corporate for Jungan people in North Queensland. We work directly with the board and directors as traditional custodians to learn about their priorities and aspirations for Jungan country on the tablelands west of Cairns. If you'd like to learn more about Jungan country, the journey of its people and the challenges they've faced, you can visit their new website and view their video at the address given on this slide. The NNTAC generously allowed Geoscience Australia uh, to learn from their healthy country planning, cultural mapping project and new range of program planning to understand how knowledge sharing could support their priorities in managing Jungan country. In one example, we learned how earth observation data could be used for specific tasks, such as the use of high resolution satellite imagery to plan track grading and fence construction locations. But the focus of geoscience activities we designed together were related to cap capability building and particularly in recording information about soils for managing Jungan country. Now, from a geologist's point of view, understanding soils is different from mainstream Western soil science. Soils in geology have a historical science focus and are studied more in relation to their formation and their relationships to geology, landscapes and landscape history. We learned that soils for Jungan people form part of a holistic view of relationships between plants, animals, rocks and people. Knowing about soils is part of knowing about the health of country because their relationships with life. Both approaches come together broadly in storytelling about landscapes and country. Knowledge of soils also has practical application to land management tasks, such as in vegetation management, erosion control and construction. For these reasons, we've been co-designing a range of field guide in the soils and geology of Jungan country, with instructions on the standard procedures for describing soil characteristics. Directors of the NNTAC provided their perspectives on soils uh, in this knowledge sharing product. This ranger guide is planned for release in time for the recruitment of the new Jungan rangers later in 2024 as a tool for their capability building in geoscience.
He also worked with the Lake Air Basin Rangers, an established First Nations Ranger team operated by the Dugalangi Aboriginal Corporation. The rangers manage natural and re cultural resources across the expanse of the Lake Air Drainage Basin in Queensland. We work directly with the First Nations Ranger Program Management and Rangers. The Lake Air Basin Rangers Program, in turn, is overseen by the Georgina Diamantina Cooper Aboriginal Group, a collective of traditional owner representatives from across the major catchment areas of Western Queensland. Because of this relationship, we learned not only about the work of the rangers, but the priorities of traditional owners in Western Queensland as they relate to the earth sciences. Together, we identified two key geoscience areas uh, where we could design activities in ranger capability building. The first of these, again, uh, was soils as a focus of capability building. The links between soil and the health of country and the relevance of soil characteristics to many tasks undertaken by the rangers underlie this interest. But soils also offer the opportunity for telling stories about landscapes. The Lake Air Basin in Queensland has diverse landscapes that reflect environmental changes over millions and thousands of years. And these influence characteristics of soils across the basin. The changes in landscapes, which include dune fields, hills, deeply weathered landscapes, channel country and gibber plains, are reflected also in Geoscience Australia's radiometric data shown on the map which displays the broad changes in surface soils and rock types. We undertook two knowledge sharing study tours across Western Queensland with the rangers, looking at landscape history and gaining experience in describing and recording the very different soil properties across the basin. These tours guided the content of our co-designed ranger field guide in the soils and landscapes of the Lake Air Basin Queensland, also planned for release in 2024. The second key geoscience area where we could design activities in ranger capability building was groundwater. There are considerable gaps in groundwater systems knowledge in Western Queensland. Traditional custodians of the Georgina Diamantina Cooper Aboriginal Group told us that they require consistent baseline knowledge of aquifers to manage country in Western Queensland. At the same time, the Lake Air Basin Rangers are strengthening their capacity and diversifying their services. We began a collaboration with the Lake Air Basin Rangers where we deliver training in groundwater sampling and data collection. This capability building could result in a fee-for-service arrangement under which the Rangers would provide ongoing groundwater data to Geoscience Australia in the Lake Air Basin region. In this way, the Rangers are also able to support traditional custodians with data for longer-term land, water and vegetation management. And finally, we worked with the Anandili Aqua Land Council, or ALC, which is a corporate Commonwealth entity that supports the 14 clans of the Groot Archipelago in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Here we worked indirectly with traditional owners through the ALC's data unit in a project that they designed. Their project, which is funded by the CRC for Developing Northern Australia, is to develop a geographic information system based on traditional owner priorities for land management planning and activation of the Indigenous state in the Groot Archipelago. Geoscience Australia joined the project as a partner, along with the geospatial tech company Aerometrics and the Australian National University. So the ALC and the Australian National University will report on the results of this project in 2025. In the meantime, through the Exploring for the Future program, Geoscience Australia provided non-cultural base layered data for their geographic information system under the themes such as soils, geology, water and topography. We learned that the ALC's priorities included assessing landscape and coastal change. So we facilitated integration of earth observation data in their system to support both traditional owners and the ALC in planning for future land use and uh, management. And a collaboration has developed between Geoscience Australia's Digital Earth Australia projects and the ALC to validate and improve inter intertidal elevation models for use in Anadiliaqua coastal and marine enterprises and to consider further innovations in earth observation tools. The program began an initiative to share knowledge with First Nations Australian organisations. In a short space of time and with the generosity of our partners' time and knowledge, we have together been able to identify earth science themes that are the start of Geoscience Australia's contribution to the journey of investment in First Nations people's management of country. Landscape change is relevant for knowing about vegetation change, surface water change and coastal zone changes that are part of the decision-making process for planning and managing country. 
Geoscience Australia's earth observation data and tools have a role to play in this decision-making process. Soils have both practical applications to management of country and also have a role in understanding the complexity of earth and life relationships and in knowledge sharing about the history of landscapes and country. Groundwater is a key interest of traditional custodians in land and water management and a theme under which ranger programs could provide data collection services for government. In summary, knowledge sharing under these themes can help Geoscience Australia build relationships with First Nations people for environmental, economic and social benefits. We're very grateful and would like to thank the people we've come to know in this work for their trust, generosity and time in sharing their journey with us. This work would not have occurred without your ongoing drive to work together with Geoscience Australia as partners in knowledge sharing. We're also grateful for the Geoscience Australia staff across the divisions who contributed to the on-country activities developed as part of this work or met and shared knowledge with our partners when they visited us in Canberra. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. It's great to see the important and enduring relationships being established throughout the program. Mark Webster will now share with us the journey it took to develop the new innovative digital pathways for getting our science to its users. Mark Webster has been a part of Geoscience Australia and its predecessors for many, many years and has been involved throughout the Exploring for the Future program, as well as many other science initiatives. With a science background, Mark now is more focused on the dark side of ICT, not sure what that one is, uh, and he represents our science colleagues in all data and digital matters and manages the ever-changing ICT program as part of EFTF. Mark also leads the ICT team within the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Thank you, Mark. Hello, I'm Mark Webster, Director of Information Services within the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Today I'm representing all the information management and technology individuals and projects within the EFTF program. GA staff who help design, develop, create, load and manage many of the innovative digital outcomes you will see throughout the showcase presentations. Technical staff who work in partnership with our science colleagues to create groundbreaking digital pathways and new innovative solutions. Achievements which in some cases happen behind the scenes. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge these software engineers, developers, data compilers and managers, spatial analysts and project staff for the importance of their contributions for the successful delivery of the EFTF program. For this presentation, I want to take you on a high level but brief overview of some of the innovative digital pathways the EFTF program created. Capabilities which deliver highly complex geological and geophysical data to our science users. I only have a few minutes to summarise eight years of outcomes, so please bear with me. But before we go into what was achieved, let's assess the online pathways we had over eight years ago, before the EFTF program. Our delivery pathways were obviously a lot more elementary and what now seem a lot simpler, but they were very capable and in some cases GA was leading edge. Before EFTF, users had online access to display and delivery capabilities, simple GIS functions that in some cases you had to have specific third-party hardware, software or plug-in requirements to simply view the data. We were also only just starting to investigate online analysis and 3D capabilities. It could be done, but it wasn't easily accessible for all users. Back then it was primarily based on the discovery and delivery concept, where the focus was to display specific data sets and provide the option for a simple download. Still a notable requirement to this day. But we knew we could do more. Within GA we had the right strategies and governance in place, and the drive was certainly ready for change. We just needed the right pathway to move forward. The EFTF program gave us this opportunity for change, to evolve our technology skills and knowledge base, to establish more interactive and innovative digital pathways, to provide the whole of GA the ability to mature its knowledge in data stewardship and online digital capabilities, as well as to push the boundaries into what would not be achieved in the past. The EFTF program was seen as a pathway to really mature our knowledge and technical capabilities, to progress and solve a lot of what we've always wanted to achieve for delivering complex geological data. Put simply, we wanted to ensure our data was more accessible to the scientific community. 
but extras can be included to improve stakeholder science outcomes. We recognise from previous programs that users wanted high quality data that they can pose science questions to, to engage specialist decision support tools which did complex multi-criteria assessments on the fly, to perform complex data analysis through a simple browser interface. It was the opportunity to ensure our data was interoperable and where applicable, open source. We recognise we can't change a user's software or hardware capabilities, but we can provide the data so it's accessible across multiple platforms to be technology agnostic. We knew the EFTF program will need to deliver a large amount of data, ranging from simple vectors, complex grids and 3D volumes to very large multi-layer data sets. We needed to integrate all data and information so external users can perform their own analysis from a single entry point without needing to download or purchase expensive software packages. And of course, there is always the need to still download data, but we recognise it's not just that. It's needed to include spatial and non-spatial filtering and searching over multiple data sets and then delivering options for download formats. All capabilities we have done in the past, but never through a single interface for the ease of our stakeholders. So that was our wish list. Now, what was it you, the actual users, wanted? At the beginning of EFTF, we consulted with a proportion of the geoscientific community, including government, the resources industry, and parts of the community, asking what, why, and how will you interact with EFTF data. Many users recognise GA has vast geological and geophysical storage holdings. So the ability to search through hundreds of millions of rows, records, and petabytes of data to find a single value, file or data set is always required. The need to access and search our data holdings was identified as a priority and to be honest, a capability all staff would like to have within GA. You wanted to be able to answer science questions on the fly. Knowing you are using trusted quality assured data, data you can interact with with simple GIS functions all through a single online capability to be able to produce a map and place it on a presentation with ease. And yet you wanted to be able to perform complex criteria assessments of multi data sets and provide a timely response based on user definitions, spatial searching and complex decision requests. Our stakeholders wanted to be anonymous, feel secure and apply direct connections to the data source. They also need to be quick, no extra clicks, plugins or extra loading required. You require the need to load your own data into the same tool and interact with GA's vast data holdings all together. But you're also requested to link our data to your in-house tools, either at work, home, or out in the field. 3D visualization and interaction came up. Though it was recognized this could be difficult, but it was highlighted that if you could do it, then it would be a great basis for other agencies to follow as well. All logical stuff really, but did we miss anything? Okay, so you've heard of what the users want, but what was actually delivered? Let's highlight just a few data pathways that delivers our science to its users. Users will always want to download data and it's a feature that will always remain. And yet we also know data is more than just points on a map. The goal is to continue to deliver science data easily using standardized data models with rich attributes. It's what we call well-described data. It is designed to enhance your science analysis experience. By following particular data standards, Users can do more than just select multiple data sets based on spatial or non-spatial searching. They can also perform customized data delivery functions and individual data set filtering and complex data querying, all connecting to the primary data source, which in some cases could be via a non-GA source. While it's great to access, analyze, and visualize GA data, perhaps you'd like to include your own data and integrate it with GA's data for further analysis, or better still, Connect to our standardized web services and display EFTF data through your own networks and in-house GIS applications. In many cases, these services are updated every 24 hours, so you'll always get the latest data directly to your own GIS package. So why do we use open source and standardized web services, and not just certain data types or particular formats? to be as technology agnostic as possible and for direct connectivity. 
As the Geoscience National Agency, it is our role to deliver geoscience data as easily and effectively as possible to all user types, even if you're using our online capabilities or not. It means we can create and deliver well-described data that can be used to enhance users' decision-making without trying to force users to use a particular technology stack. So, what are the other opportunities our users have to access our science data? A major pathway for accessing and analysing science data is through our decision support and multi-criteria assessment tools. Various tools and functions will help the user ask key science questions based on scenarios, certain criteria, filtering, or specific science specifications, all on the fly. Detailed graphs, profiles, heat maps, and grids can all be returned to the user for analysis. Each time a user can save or rerun analysis based on different criteria. Some of these include specific evidence-based decision capabilities, including the highly publicized Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool and the Green Steel Economic Fairway Mapper. Fast and easy to use capabilities to increase confidence for investors and industry partners. Other analytical tools are also available, many based on specific disciplines for complex data analysis, including hydrogeochemistry, inorganic geochemistry, petroleum, source rock, and rock properties, just to name a few. All available to users to access through the data discovery portal. And if you have trouble using them, help guides and how-to movies are available to guide users through an assessment and analysis process. Users can easily visualize and analyze highly complex data sets without plugins or, or with any other major software requirements. Everything is now based in the cloud which provides users with the consistent and fast access to secure capabilities. This includes 3D visualization, which can be applied to both 2D and 3D data sets with just a click of a button. It's another great way to appreciate a different viewpoint of geological and geophysical data when viewed in 3D. With all these different pathways and digital opportunities, how much actual data and functions can users now access? As part of the EFTF program, we have loaded over 25 million data points into 23 new and existing databases. This is a massive 550% increase from what we had before EFTF. And we still have millions more data points to load. And that's not including the hundreds of terabytes of newly acquired geological and geophysical data sets where the majority is also available online. You have heard it was a key strategy for the program to be technology agnostic. And now because of this, we have delivered up to 50 open source web service layers, which can be accessed through our data discovery portal or from your own internal GIS application. We've got well over 30 interactive tools and capabilities within our portals and websites that users can interact with and visualize data in multiple different ways. Tools which we can analyze data on the fly, making decisions much quicker and more interactive for users. Thousands of lines of code of online research, including machine learning analysis, was developed using both cloud and academia high-performance computing infrastructure, designed so users don't need high-end infrastructure capabilities, artificial intelligence capabilities which will only grow for the future. We have audited and searched our own data stores and rediscovered legacy data sets which could be useful when analysing newly acquired EFTF data hundreds of old legacy geological and geophysical data sets from previous programs are now available online for users to interact with. The aim was to provide digital access to every aspect of spatial and non-spatial data produced from the program, from field data to documents, including everything that has been published and all of it is available online for people to access. And the proof is with the users who are using these pathways. The statistics show us that we are now get over 5,000 users interacting with these digital pathways monthly, including downloading nearly 2,000 related data sets each month, a massive increase in geoscience data uptake since before the EFTF program. And all of this can be found within the GA Data Discovery Portal and the Exploring for the Future website. So when it comes to delivering digital pathways for users to access geoscience data, what do we need to consider and prepare for the future? Though the EFTF program is wrapping up, it is certainly not the end. Everything we built was designed to be maintained for the future. We will continue to build and maintain more analysis tools, including doing more with 3D and volumetric type capabilities, visualization and analysis. We will continue to establish functionality for real-time data streaming, 
I use the term from field to finder, to be able to provide even faster access to raw data for decision making. Artificial intelligence is becoming more widely used and like it or not, a capability and opportunity which we all need to embrace. It's something we need to consider now and into the future. And I'm not just talking about for our own internal advanced analytical requirements, but also making sure our data is compatible for external users to use for their own AI research. We need to make sure our data remains open and agnostic for any type of future analysis. Our ability to support an increase in research and advanced analytical techniques will require a rethink of our infrastructure requirements including an increase in high performance and quantum computing, no matter where the data is located. Perhaps an option we need to consider is an open source style model for data science, to create trusted partnerships with key agencies and industries to provide guidance and feedback and work with us on data quality, to have open engagement to improve data assurance and quality, to turn our data into knowledge by engaging the community. We acknowledge we have a very wide user base, so we need to consider all our users, from community users to industry partners to policyholders and science researchers. They all want access to our data, but each one in a different way. We will continue to work with our users and take a user-centric and co-design approach in how you would like to interact with our data, to build partnerships with our stakeholders and improve online accessibility and usability no matter who the users are. And this leads me to the next presentation, which is an example where we have already started this. Thanks, Mark. The program certainly made a great step forward in rapid online delivery of data and decision support information, and is really pushing to make the value created through the EFTF program as available to as many people as possible in as many formats as possible. Our final speaker in this session is Dr. Catherine Waltenberg, Catherine has a science background with a PhD in geochronology and 10 years experience as an isotype geoscientist at Geoscience Australia. Catherine also has a passion for maximizing the value of government geoscience data and finding new ways to revitalize Geoscience Australia's vast and growing data holdings. Over the last two years, she has focused on increasing the accessibility of our geological information. Today, Catherine will be launching the pilot version of GeoInsight, a new digital system to help non-geoscientists get access to the geological information they need. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce you to a new digital hub that we've created to help access geological insights. To set the scene a little more, our world leading products are helping narrow the search for our nation's valuable resources. And we've heard about the economic value that we're supporting at Geoscience Australia to uh, the economy. But it goes beyond economic value. Uh, the information we provide also supports us to find the resources we need to support the energy transition and to support healthy environment and communities. We are clearly delivering great science that has enormous value. So a lot of the value we support doesn't have a dollar value. Data and insights um, help us manage water resources. As residents of the driest inhabited continent, we know how precious water is. It's critical to the health of our environment and communities. This map shows some of the work that we did during the Exploring for the Future with collaborators across the Katitanda Lake Eyre Basin. Uh, and there are plenty more insights about groundwater to come in the following sessions. So if you've been to one of these showcases before, you'll know at least a couple of things about our work. And that's that we produce a lot of highly valuable, quite technical information. The reason that it's technical is so that we can ensure it's high quality and trusted. So in a way we need to show our working and it's the level of detail that a lot of our users need. Geoscience Australia has an extraordinary depth of data and information relevant to a large range of users. Uh, but due to that um, depth, it risks becoming inaccessible to many users due to its density and requirement for technical expertise. And this is a challenge that we're tackling in my team. To address this challenge, our vision is to provide a web-based application that gathers together key insights from across the spectrum of Geoscience Australia data and products and beyond, and provides a system for helping you get started in your search, to understand what it all means, 
and to set you on a path to continue your journey armed with the context required for making evidence-based decisions. The intention of this application isn't to answer every question for everybody, but to build a baseline understanding or point of reference so that if you need to know more, you better know where and who to go to to get answers to your questions. There are many people who could benefit from such a system. Uh, it's a diverse range of people across government, industry, communities, um, but there are some commonalities that we found when we went out and talked to them. That's that they're very busy people uh, trying to address very complicated, multifaceted problems, and often geology is a small component of the information they need. Uh, they're not usually geoscientists, um, although you will find geoscientists popping up in the most unusual places. Um, so that means that they don't necessarily have access to the technical expertise or the tools that we take for granted at Geoscience Australia. But very importantly, all these people are experts in their fields, whether they're working in policy or on country, and it's important that we respect that knowledge that they have. So if you tuned into last year's showcase, you might have heard me speak about our concept to achieve this goal, but how close did we get? First of all, we've got a new name. Welcome to the launch of the GeoInsight pilot. Now, I'm about to show you a run through of the site, which you can access by going to geoinsight.ga.gov.au. This is the landing page that you'll see first. Uh, and on the front page, it just gives a bit of context. So it clarifies what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make it quick and easy to get geoscience information. We're trying to provide information specific to regions around Australia, and it's for everyone. We're Everyone means that you don't have to be a geoscientist to understand what you're reading. Uh, below that, there's a quick um, intro to what to expect from the system, but because I'm about to do a run through, I'll skip that and we'll go straight to jumping in. So first up, we need to answer a couple of questions. First of all, pick a topic. Um, be because of the focus of exploring for the future, we have content on mining and minerals, energy resources, and water with a focus on groundwater. I'm going to stick with minerals to start with. And then decide where you're looking. So if you're familiar with our regions, you can just pick one of them and type it into the bar. But if you're not sure, any street address will work to get you, and it'll take you to a region that's relevant to that address. So then I'll click next. All right, so here we are in the ACT region, uh, looking at mining and minerals. Uh, as you can see from the map, there's not a lot um, of mines and mineral deposits in the ACT region. So let's just pop over to a part of Australia that has a, a little bit more activity. The Geraldton region. All right, as you can see, in contrast to the ACT, there's a lot of mining activity happening in Western Australia. There's a little map legend that goes with the information that you're seeing on the screen. And we can also change the topic easily from say minerals to energy and have a look at uh, uranium and thorium and coal mines as well as renewable geothermal and hydrogen plants in this region. Um, we've also provided a couple of simplified infrastructure layers which you can turn on and off. So for example, you can see oil and gas pipelines, or major road networks and there's a little um, legend to go with each of these symbologies if you click on the arrows next to each button. Also on the screen we have a little pop-up window which shows you some key information about each region. So in Geraldton the major population centres are here um, and Geraldton itself is, is the major population centre here. Top industries, mining makes the list as well as healthcare, education and training. And below this, we can see a little blurb about each of the topics available. So minerals, it looks like there's production of a lot of different commodities. Energy, uh, it looks like it's almost everything that we're tracking. And there's a little bit of information about groundwater. So if you want to know more than what you've seen on this page, you can also pick the topics that you'd like to um, see a more detailed report. I'm interested in everything, so I'll t turn all the ticks on and then we'll jump across to the report by clicking on the Generate Report button. So this is the report for the Geraldton region. It contains the information that we saw on the previous page as, as well as a lot more context. So for example, we have a regional summary which highlights some of the most, um, some of the interesting aspects of the region beyond just the, the facts and figures that we're providing here. 
We picked mining and minerals, so here's a summary of pr production for the Geraldton region. Um, you can see by the commodities in bold that it's producing ilmenite, manganese ore, rare earth elements, rutile and zircon, all of which are critical minerals, and the strategic materials of copper and zinc. Um, we also provide a link to those lists for more context if you're not sure what that means. And then we have grouped things into commodities and you can see which among them are being produced um, or not. The map's included below um, and the green dots on this map are operating mines and every other colour uh, are not operating mines, they're either deposits or closed mines or something along those lines. And that means that um, as, as well as the commodities that are being produced, there's also potential for other commodities to be produced and that's what the next section is about. So for example, you can see that this region has a much expanded potential for a lot of critical minerals um, that might warrant some more investigation and, and, and so on. Uh, for energy, as it looked like on the map, um, Geraldton region produces a lot of different energy types, barring coal. Um, and we've also provided a little bit of an estimate of potential for energy production in the region, as well as the potential for geological storage of carbon and hydrogen. Again, we have the map so that you can um, compare with, with what's said above. Um, and in this case, we've also provided an example, a bit more detail about wind and solar hydrogen production potential using an extract from our hydrogen economic fairways tool to demonstrate how we're um, assessing the potential for different regions. So in this map, just quickly, um, the reds um, highlight more positive potential for hydrogen production from wind and solar, and the blues are less favourable. Uh, and it's that kind of information that we're drawing into GeoRapper to help um, provide insights. Along with that, we provide a, a variety of links to places external to GeoInsight. These ones are all um, Geoscience Australia products, but you'll see below we're also looking to link to external sources where possible. For water, so this map shows groundwater provinces. Groundwater provinces uh, contain aquifers from which you can extract water. This map's a bit complicated because it's showing layers of geology that are actually stacked on top of each other. And we're, we're still developing ways to make this a bit clearer. But in the Geraldton region, you can see that the Carnarvon Basin, the Perth Basin, the Western Australian Fractured Rock Province, and a little bit of this light blue province um, are all uh, within the region. So we've colour mapped these uh, polygons to the table. So you can see, for example, Perth Basin is this blue colour. That's just to help guide you. We provide information about water levels and salinities, uh, the main uses of groundwater from these aquifers and links to extra, more, much more detailed information. As I mentioned previously, we're also looking to link out to external sources where appropriate. The Bureau of Meteorology is the authority on water data, so they're a key um, uh, link to provide here. And Digital Earth Australia provides satellite um, observations of water from space, which brings in that surface water context as well. Uh, just before I pop out of the live demo, I just wanted to highlight at the very top of this page, there's also a download button, and you can use that to um, export the, all this information as a printable PDF to share. So that's the end of our live demo. Where to next? Well, we really want to hear from you. This is the pilot version and we're keen to develop it along what you would find most useful yourself in your work. So please let us know um, anything that you'd like to see differently. We do have a mandate to continue this work. There's the, the new Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative the aim of which is to enable Geoscience Australia to comprehensively map Australia's natural resources. And in particular, it will provide essential geoscience information to a wide audience. And GeoInsight is one of those ways that we plan to deliver this information. We want to make sure that the information that we provide is useful to you. Here's the link again to GeoInsight. There's also the QR codes, geoinsight.ga.gov.au. Please get in touch, tell us what you think, whether you think we're spot on or missed the mark, we'd love to hear from you. We're also running a couple of workshops and there's a survey on the Exploring for the Future Showcase webpage, which you can access through the top QR code. 
And as I mentioned in the live demo, there's a way to provide access directly in GeoInsight um, by clicking the Provide Feedback button on the bottom ribbon. When information is widely available, everyone benefits. And if there's anything you hear in the coming days of the Exploring for the Future showcase that you think should have a spot in GeoInsight, please let us know about that too. Finally, to everyone who has made this part of the journey a success, thank you. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to see the co-design of this platform to ensure that the information provided is not just useful, but is also easy to use. And this brings us to the questions and answers session for this afternoon. Our superstar presenters are here in the studio ready to answer your questions. So, as I said earlier, please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen. And where possible, please include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. All right, we've already got one come through for Verity. This is from Anna Petz. The question, Verity, for you is, really love the Rocks That Shaped Australia exhibition and hope to visit it soon. Just wondering, is there a section for viewers or museum goers to send in their object or idea about each rock? Would be fascinating to gauge community thoughts and ideas about these rocks and how they understand and interact with them. Thanks, you, and thanks, Anna. Um, hope you're well. Um, there is a section in the exhibit itself where you can put up a, it asks you basically what rock do you think shaped, shaped Australia? Um, and you can put your post-it note up on that. We do collect that information and that data. Um, one of the, we've already enacted one of those. We got, kept getting opal put up there. So we've now put in an opal rock, which is a beautiful um, Yao Moon specimen from Queensland. Um, so we've done that, but we've also done, um, before we, when we set up the exhibit, while we were planning for it, we did a whole bunch of concepts testing where we got um, the public's um, ideas and which one, which, which rocks and stories resonated the most with them. So that's part, that we use that to help design the exhibit as well. Um, but we absolutely um, welcome any and all suggestions. Thanks, Verity. And Anna, we really hope you can come in and enjoy the uh, exhibition at some stage. Uh, another one from Anna. This one's for you, Margie. Uh, wonderful to have such a summary that highlights the simple, effective uh, and often neglected aspects of engagement and land access. Quick question, what is your one must do from EFTF Learnings as you head into the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Program? Okay, um, a, a quick answer to that would be built-in flexibility. But um, I guess what I mean by that is uh, whenever we're approaching land access, people have, you know, set ideas of schedules and uh, even exactly where they want to go and what roads they want to take and things like that. It's really important to build in uh, flexibility to, to your thinking, not just in your schedules and things like that, but also in the way that you engage because there is no real one, one size fits all when it comes to engagement. So we create a whole bunch of tools and we think, yep, we've got it, we know how to do this now, and then we find it doesn't work on some communities or, and um, does work on some communities and not with others. So uh, going into to, to be very perceptive to the body language, um, to the people that you're speaking to and their needs and adapting on the fly, having that flexibility is really important. Awesome, terrific advice, thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question now, so be ready. Uh, all of you in your roles and in your presentations reflected on the importance of engagement in some way, whether that's early engagement, whether it's engagement through co-design or whether it's engagement through the delivery of services. So how do you make sure that that stakeholder engagement is genuine, that it's two-way and that we're really understanding and considering the needs of stakeholders? Um, maybe the more provocative version of the question is how do we make sure we're not just talking to people who we know like what we're doing and where we're, how we're doing it? Does anyone want to start there? Maybe I'll throw to you, Catherine, to, to be, kick us off. Yeah, thanks, Clive. So it is a challenge to find people to talk to, <laughs> especially when you're trying to do something new. You know, it, it's always nice to hear people encouraging you, but you want the truth to make something um, valuable. Uh, and particularly for Geo Insight, because we were trying to reach uh, a different audience to the more technical users the, who use the data discovery portal, um, we had to really think hard about how best to do that, how to, to engage with people that we may not have necessarily done before. And um, honestly, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of consideration. Um, but uh, just, I, I guess, you know, using networks is a great starting point. But again, like you, you're still biasing your data. And in a way, I think. 
that's probably unavoidable in, in to some degree. Um, so I think an important component of it is also being aware that you probably aren't getting the full picture. Um, being aware that you know the people that you ask to engage with workshops and surveys are the people who are already positively or possibly negatively biased towards what you're doing. So for us, I think um, just keep keep trying, keep keep thinking about it. Don't assume that because you've heard um, a small set of voices that you've heard everything that you that you need to know about something. Um, but I'm wondering about other people's thoughts about that too. Uh, I guess one of the the kind of examples that came from the land access space and then bled into Meredith's kind of project would be where we were, you know, engaging with uh, a bunch of people who um, were very positive towards our project and some who weren't. And because of the way that we engaged with those people, um, they were still responsive and asking questions and interested in our work. And because of their interest, that led into the relationship that, that let, led into Meredith's work with the um, First Nations people as well. And we do find that, you know, maybe they, their people aren't so keen on what you're there to talk to them about, but they might be interested in another aspect in G, of GA. Okay. And um, that's a good way to open up about what all of the work that GA does, not just what you're there to talk to them about. So I guess being open to, to talk about things other than your interests is, is important too. I think that leads into listening to understand rather than listening to have a response um, to, to, to any stakeholder, like listening to what they truly want and even listening for the things that they're not saying, I think is really important. And I also think it's really important to revisit. Mm. So, you know, for example, the work that you do, you, you might listen to a community and you go, oh, I'll make these changes. But going back and saying, hey, I made these changes, what do you think of that? I think that can be really powerful and that's how we get that genuine engagement is that continued conversation. Mm. Um, I think that's, I mean, you've done that really well, Meredith, in your work. You've, you know, mm. done something, learnt, gone back and said, hey, what about this? I think that's something that's that's been really, uh, really good about your project. Yeah, indeed. And um, working from access engagement to us, uh, we were working with First Nations Australians in sort of a pilot project, but in a very new area for Geoscience Australia. So to make to, the way to make sure that that engagement is genuine is to go in with that mind frame that it is genuine, uh, that we don't have a hidden ch agenda with what we're doing. We're, they're really there to listen and learn about uh, what First Nations Australians need and how Geoscience Australia can uh, support First Nations Australians priorities. So um, it was it was really a learning um, process to, to learn how to listen properly. It's so hard for for, for us as scientists to get our minds out of our own sphere of knowledge and our own experience and the way that we think we might be able to help uh, help people or support people. Um, but if you if you do that, if you get rid of all of your agendas and just listen and spend a lot of time listening, uh, then then you can actually um, make sure that that engagement is genuine and, and you learn things that um, you don't expect to learn and, you, and then you realise actually there's a whole lot of, there's a world of opportunity for Geoscience Australia to move into that we just haven't learnt about yet because we uh, we're just learning how to listen. Yeah, I love that. Uh, that's a beautiful way to summarise that. So going in with genuine interest, empathy and respect for our stakeholders. Sounds amazing. Uh, I have another one for you, Meredith. So this is also from Anna Petz. Um, so good to hear about the knowledge sharing Aboriginal community, knowledge sharing with Aboriginal communities and building those very important relationships. Uh, and the national Natural Resource Manager and Farmer User Guides sound very helpful. Did you also develop one for Aboriginal communities? Yes. Yeah, so um, that's actually, uh, uh, the part of the process is actually learning how to co-design. And, and the idea is to bring a product together as, as a result of this process. So the, uh, the uh, Natural Resource Manager and Farmer User Guides, which Access Engagement ha had developed, uh, is one example of how you start to bring in other people's perspectives and priorities into, into products. We, with two groups, uh, yes, have been developing um, guides uh, that, in that um, integrate um, non-sensitive cultural information about perspectives about uh, management of country and, and, um, and the way people view country uh, with geoscience in, uh, not, uh, knowledge and information um, from a more uh, Western science uh, perspective. Um, we're very close to, to being able to get those um, 
published. Uh, we're still working on them. Uh, it, it is a, a, a process um, to make sure that um, we do it the right way because we don't want to break trust with anybody. So we, ha we have to do this properly and uh, to, to manage uh, the way that we integrate uh, knowledge into these guides. But there will be uh, ranger guides for the Lake Air Basin or Katatandi, Kata uh, Kata <laughs> Lake Air Basin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also for uh, in North Queensland, jungling country in, in uh, North East Queensland. So we'll have two ranger guides and this, this will be the result of um, uh, this process of working together to work out how we bring our knowledge systems together. Uh, just to add to that, um, one of the things we found too also in the land access space is quite often the natural resource managers and farmers are also Aboriginal people out in the remote areas. So even though those guides are very, very similar actually because the way that you use geoscience for, um, that might be interesting to natural resource managers is actually pretty similar to farmers as well. They're, but they're essentially natural resource managers as well. Um, it, it, you know, the, the target audience is across the whole country and a lot of in the remote areas that use Aboriginal people who are farming and who are the natural resource managers. So um, I know it's not specifically for that particular cohort, but they are part of that cohort, the greater cohort, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Catherine, one for you from Michelle Spencer. Um, so this one's around GeoInsight, and how often is the information in GeoInsight updated? That's a, a really great question. So. Um, the way that it's reading in information, it can be updated as frequently as needed. At the moment, right now, because it's just been set up, we haven't established update schedules, uh, but we have already made one relatively significant update to um, move from, now what's the acronym? The Australian, oh gosh, AIMR, I'm thinking Australian something mineral resources, apologies. <laughs> From, from the previous year's version to this year's version. And we did that um, r relatively soon after it was um, released. So uh, we're still finding our feet with that, um, but uh, it, it's, it's intended to be up to date. So we are, the, the reason we built it the way we did was so that we can push out updates um, when significant new pieces of work um, come up. But at the moment it is, uh, our main um, update schedule does concern those major national scale um, commodity reports, the yearly updates. Mm. Thanks, Catherine. Meredith, this one's from Helen Anderson. Uh, so good to hear about the knowledge. No. Oh, oh, we've oh. oh, we've gone backwards, <laughs> apologies. I was about to read the same one. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, we're having a minor technical difficulty. Please hold with us. All right, this one's for you, Mark. Um, so, can you elaborate a bit on what some of the difficulties were with making 3D data available um, and how you dealt with things like file size, formats and processing? Thanks Clive. So yeah, 3D data online is actually quite difficult. Um, in the past it was a problem not just because of file size but because of people's computers couldn't actually interact with the graphics itself. So what we've basically done is all that information, all that data is now presented in, uh, let's just say, a cloud and all the, uh, all the workings are happening there and you're, what you're seeing on screen is basically just what your screen is presenting, which makes it so much easier. We've also uh, invested and looked into what different stakeholders uh, want to interact with this data. So from a format's point of view, what uh, standards they want to follow. And we try to do a lot of the processing on our side not on the client side. So that just makes it easier for the client to be able to do things and there's a whole lot of machines and wizard bang things happening behind the scenes that are actually doing all the work for you. They were the main part, but also graphics. Graphics was a key issue as well. And I know that some of the um, techies who worked on that are really, really proud of the work yep. they did to optimise that. So I'm sure whoever that question was from, if you wanted to send through a follow-up question, um, I'm sure some of the tech who worked on that would be happy to, to dig into the details with you. Uh, Verity, this one's from Wes Nichols. Uh, any thoughts on linking your rock display to the National Rock Garden in Canberra? Yeah, so um, great question. So um, I guess one, the, the first lot of rocks that we have in the Rocks of Shape Australia exhibit 
is based on Marita Bradshaw's paper from 2019, Rocks That Made Australia. So Marita grabbed, um, Marita wrote about all the rocks that she thought um, contributed to Australia in some way in the past, and we've we've sort of rejuvenated that and updated it. Um, so in that way, they don't. They, some of them will probably be the same as the rock garden, but um, we've got a time walk outside that is absolutely related to the um, to the National Rock Garden. Um, but I think there are definitely synergies between um, all of the different types of rock displays that we have. Um, and also Rocks of Shape Australia, um, I think if, if it was to continue in the future, we would like to link it to the current Geoscience Australia work and the stories that our work and the rocks that we work on, as well as all the other things that we do at Geoscience Australia um, and how those results can contribute to society um, in whatever way that is. So um, it's a great idea and um, I'm, Marita is involved in all of those things. So I'm sure um, if she has a great idea or we have a great idea, we can share that and see where it goes. Awesome, plenty of opportunities to keep improving. Yeah. Uh, Margie, this one's from Helen Anderson. Uh, is there any plans to make another video for consultation that deals with passive airborne geophysical surveys uh, rather than active EM signals? And this would be useful for community consultation for early stage exploration. Yeah, good question. We have got a list of, of animations we would like to create. Um, however, um, there is a already on the internet under a um, web page called Awesome, as in O R E, Awesome Resources, some really good animations already on gravity and magnetic surveys for airborne surveys. So we decided when we were prioritizing which animations to create first, to start with, we wanted to focus on the techniques that we use the most at Geoscience Australia for our field activities. Um, and we do do mag radiometric and magnetic surveys. But um, because those animations already exist, although they're not specifically designed for, for us and um, have a lot more in them that I probably chop out, that they do exist already. So I can, we can refer to them already. Um, but yes, we, we have a whole list of, of survey techniques that we, we would still like to make in the future. So now that I've got your question, I'll, I'll prioritise those ones over the other because I know that um, you know, more than me thinks that we need them. So thank you for, for your question, Helen. Thanks, Helen. Appreciate the input. Um, all right, Mark, this one's from Marina Costello. Um, and Marina would like to know if you have any comments about database management to support machine learning functionality. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very specific one, Marina. So uh, the future for us is going to be AI and machine learning. There's no question about that and it's something that we have to uh, prepare for for the future. One of the things that I'm conscious of, especially under the RAP initiative, is how we prepare our internal data holdings that it's, so it's going to be compatible with AI and machine learning for the future. We don't know yet if it is or isn't capable, and we've got a lot of work to actually make that happen. But from a database point of view, one of the things I am conscious of is we have a wealth of information within our databases, and uh, while a fairly large amount of it is available online, it's basically available based on, let's just say, on the web services or for specific tools or anything like that. It's not like a, a, an open, um, if I could say, bucket that you can ask questions of. And that's what I would like to see for the future, to be able to get the, um, the public to be able to ask a science question to our databases, to be able to bring back a particular answer and see what it basically says. We don't know what it's going to say because it comes down to the questions being asked. From a machine learning point of view, it's a real. We do a lot of stuff within the portal now. Uh, it is interacting with web services that are coming from databases. We have to just make sure we're keeping that fed and watered all the time. So whenever people run new queries, new uh, learning functionalities, that they're always getting the latest and greatest information. But it is definitely something we're thinking about for the future. That's for sure. Thank you, Marina. Um, Meredith, uh, another question for you from Anna Petz. Um, will the ranger guides be publicly available? Yeah, right from the start, uh, we've talked about that being made publicly available. So this is, it's going to be um, knowledge that's shared and that's why we have to be very careful about how we um, um, prepare the content. 
Uh, they will be publicly available, uh, managed on Geoscience Australia's um, uh, online holdings. As that, that way it will be available not only to the groups they've been working with, but to the people that they might talk to and they might want to see examples of, of this, this sort of information and how mm -hmm. you might be able to share knowledge. So uh, right from the start we've, we've talked about that and we've been clear that um, what we put into the guide uh, will be made publicly available. Yeah. Follow-on question: Do you have a rough time frame for that? Ah, uh, this spot? is uh, yeah. So um, we have a lot. We have we have the content uh, from and um, the the on-country content. Uh, we have the um, First Nations um, input into it. We have geoscience um, uh, information in there as well. Uh, the thing is, is how you do it in a way that um, I guess managers risk. Uh, just. It's a, it's a new area for both Geoscience Australia and the groups that we're working with, so um, that's why it's a, it's a longer process to get, get, to get this right and, um, uh, and to... There are a number of considerations which I may not have thought about and I've been, I'm learning as I go and so um, uh, it's working through that at the moment. So uh, it, will, it, ca it can be available um, within the next few weeks or a bit longer just depending on... on what the viewpoints are of our First Nations partners. Yeah, and back to that earlier com discussion we had around the importance of respecting our stakeholders yeah. and their views. Exactly, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, hi, Catherine. This one's from Keegan McGuffey. Um, okay, this one's a bit of a long one. Stay with me. Uh, I really think the team has done a wonderful job with GeoInsight. I think this will be super helpful for high school students studying and secondary teachers teaching earth and environmental science. First question, I was wondering whether the team was thinking of releasing some written case study style workflows, uh, similar to what we went through today, that teachers could refer to and show school teachers. I might let you answer the first one and then we'll jump to the second one. Sure. This is the exact kind of thinking and feedback that I, I love to hear when people are thinking about how what we've done can, can be used um, and education is a huge part of it you know um, we talk a lot about you know the skills shortages and that kind of thing and bringing through people with the um, um, I guess just who have a love of geology and earth sciences in their heart and uh, it, I'm, I'm pretty chuffed that you know GeoInsight could be part of that. Um, I would personally love to um, be able to engage with that and we do have teams at Geoscience Australia like the Education Centre and that kind of thing that we could um, work together with to, to produce some, some written uh, notes on, on GeoInsight. Um, I, I do think for high school students, um, yeah, it could be a really interesting way um, to, to look at the earth, particularly because it brings in that regional view. Um, so, you know, they can zoom to where their school is or whatever and look at the rocks around there and start thinking of questions. So it's a really brilliant idea. Um, and I'm glad that um, we've gotten that feedback so we can start thinking about how we might be able to do that. Mm. Terrific. And the second part of the question is, as there's a focus on examining the link between soils, subsurface geology and resources in schools, will a soil layer be something the team is considering adding? Yep. I mean, definitely, I think soils comes up a lot, you know, for, um, it's important for so many things, you know, it's, it's where our f food comes from for, and, you know, th that kind of thing. So um, I, I do think that soils is an important one to consider adding uh, in the future for sure. Um, I think we can say a lot about it and start bringing those links. Um, soils is also something that people can actually touch and interact with as opposed to like the deep earth concept so perhaps it's a bridging uh, a way to bridge that gap in not in not knowledge and start um, helping people understand the, the whole of the earth so again another fantastic suggestion um, always happy to hear more um, email EFTF if you don't get a chance to tell me in this Q&A session but uh yeah please please keep the suggestions coming for yeah. sure can I jump in and ask what what other ideas are sort of floating around in terms of the future of geo insight what's on the kind of feature backlog at the moment um, so there are, like the soils idea, there are, there are ideas for, for new topics to expand the breadth of the information that we're presenting. There's also suggestions to um, go into more information about certain topics, for example, the importance of, you know, critical minerals um, and that kind of thing. That could be something that we ex expand a bit more on. Um, but equally, there's also, um, I guess, um, extra functionality that makes the, the, the system itself more useful. So, for example, you can't, at the moment, currently extract the, the tables that are in there. 
-hmm. for anything else. So um, we have had suggestions that maybe it'd be you know, great to add that functionality. So people, again, like Mark mentioned, people want to use it for what they want to use it for yeah. in their own customised way. So um, there's a whole breadth of, of, of ways we can improve it. And the reason I'm very interested in hearing from people is because we, we need to prioritise all these great ideas because yeah. there's far more that we could do than we, we really um, can do in the short yeah. term. So what's the most important to people? That's what I want to know. And to follow on from that, a lot of the things that people are asking for, we have in the portal, but it was arguably designed for a particular set of science and technical audience. Now we're starting to see what was being said here. Now we can use that same information presented in a slightly different way to answer different questions. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually doubling up, if I yep. could say it that mm -hmm. way. Yep. So, And that's the goal for us to be able to do it that way, make it easier for all aspects of the audiences. Yep, terrific. So thank you. I think that question was from Keegan. Thank you very much for the feedback and the questions there. And we'd really encourage everybody to keep providing feedback on GeoInsight. Uh, as Catherine said, we really want to make sure that uh, it's meeting your needs. Um, and we can only do that by prioritising the things that you tell us are important. Uh, we've used up all our time, I'm afraid, and we're going to have to draw the Q&A session to a close there. Um, so a really huge thank you to Verity, Margie, Meredith, Mark and Catherine. You've been a fantastic panel and presenters and we really appreciate your time. Uh, also, thank you to everyone online who's attended today's session. Uh, I know we didn't get to everybody's question, so if you um, still have a burning question and you'd like to ask us or to make contact, please do email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. The showcase will continue tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, tomorrow morning's session is on architecture of the Australian tectonic plate. And if you haven't registered for that one, it's not too late. The link is still available on the showcase webpage. So jump on there and, and register now. If you missed anything from today's session or you want to go back and re-watch something, the recordings will be available in the coming days on our showcase webpage. Uh, for anyone who doesn't remember what that one is, it's ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. So uh, all the information on how to register is up there and the information from the sessions that have already been will be put up there over the next few days. Uh, thank you again for giving us your time today and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.